Welcome everyone to Broadway's Best for Parkinson's. My name is Caroline Colas, and I'm the director of the Health and Wellness Department at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan and the program coordinator for the Edmund J. Safra Parkinson's Wellness Program here at the JCC. Broadway Best for Parkinson's is supported by a community grant from the Parkinson's Foundation, and we have a great show for you tonight. Our topic is spirituality, sexuality, and support. Rabbi Simka Weintraub is here to celebrate the second night of Hanukkah. Cognitive hypnotherapist Suzette Shamoon will join Dr. DeRocco to talk about intimacy. Chris Jones and his wife Mary Beth will join us to talk about how they chose assisted living for Chris. And Pamela Quinn is going to get us all moving. Make sure to stay for the whole show because you don't want to miss Broadway actor Stephanie Lynn Mason sing a hit song from the show Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. And if you have any questions while you're watching tonight, please put them in the chat and we'll do our very best to answer them. And now I would like to introduce to you my friend and co-host for this evening, Dr. Alessandro DeRocco. Alex, as he prefers to be called, is here. He's uh, zooming in from the hospital on the east side. For those of you who may not know him, Alex is a much loved and world renowned neurology specialist. He's the director of movement disorders for Northwell Health here in New York City. And he is actually the reason our Parkinson's program started here at the JCC. He lives across the street from our building on 76th in Amsterdam. And 16 years ago, he had this eureka moment about creating a PD program at a community center Center where people could exercise and take classes surrounded by a caring community. So we approached our CEO, Rabbi Joy Levitt, about this idea, and our program was born. For those of you who want to participate, it's open to anyone. Um, we'll put some information in the chat, and you can sign up and join us. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you, Caroline. <clears throat> it's always a pleasure, um, as I was mentioning to you. Being part of this community has really been a, an extraordinary adventure for me and uh, um, and uh, in addition to my personal and professional life beyond what I ever imagined he would. And you know, I know you've had a long day at the hospital, so I am so glad that you're here to celebrate Hanukkah with us. Our, our first guest is Rabbi Simka Weintraub, and he's been a part of our JCC program since he was diagnosed with Parkinson's eight years ago. But I don't think you met him. I think you just met him for the first time tonight. He's a social worker as well as a rabbi, and he retired in 2020 as the rabbinic director of the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, where for 25 years he led the Jewish mm -hmm. Healing Center. We're gonna talk tonight about spirituality and how it's guided his PD journey a bit more, but since tonight is the second night of Hanukkah, and I doubt there's candles there at the hospital, I thought it would be great for those that celebrate the holiday that we do an opening, our opening meditation be the lighting of the candles tonight. Simka, welcome to Broadway's Best. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can you, Alex and I are going to turn off our cameras, would you share with our audience briefly about the importance of why Jews all over the world light the menorah as part of the Hanukkah celebration, because some of our viewers are not Jewish and they might want to know. And would you be so kind to just take us through the candle lighting ceremony as well? I'd be happy to, thank you. Back in the year 168 BCE, the Greco-Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes sent his soldiers to Jerusalem. They desecrated the temple there, which was the heart and the holiest place for Jews at that time. Antiochus also abolished Judaism, outlawing the observance of Shabbat and festivals, as well as circumcision. Altars and idols were set up for the worship of Greek gods, and uh, the Jews were offered two options, conversion or death. On the 25th day of the Hebrew month of Kislev in that year, the temple was renamed for the Greek god Zeus. A Jewish resistance movement led by a priestly family known as the Hasmoneans or the Maccabees um, developed against the cruelty of Antiochus. The head of the family was Mattathias, an elderly priest whose son Judah became the chief strategist and mil military leader of the resistance. Though greatly outnumbered, Judah Maccabee and his fighters miraculously won two major battles, routing the Greco-Syrians decisively. So Hanukkah evokes images of Jewish valor against overwhelming odds. 
But the holiday powerfully represents the refusal to submit to the religious demands of an empire practicing idolatry, the struggle against total assimilation into Greek culture and the loss of Jewish identity, and the fight for Jewish political autonomy and self-determination. It reaffirms the rights of the minority against the oppression of a majority, right over might. The famous story, the one that children especially appreciate, is that the Maccabees found only enough oil to light the temple menorah for one day, but it miraculously lasted for eight. That is why Jews worldwide and for many centuries have lived the Hanukkah, which is behind me, for eight nights, starting with one and gradually increasing to eight. The candle lighting is intended to be very simple. One short blessing before the candle lighting expresses our sanctification through the obligation to light the Hanukkah, and then a second short blessing as you actually light the candle that appreciates the miracles wrought for our ancestors in those days and at this season. So I'll uh, continue with lighting the Hanukkah. The menorah has seven branches, whereas the Hanukkah has eight. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Asher kishanu b'mitzvota v'tzivanu, L'haliker shel Chanukah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, She'asa nisim l'avoteinu, V'yamim l'ayim v'azman hazeh. Thank you. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah, Simka. Thank you. That's amazing. I loved hearing the whole story. Ah, thank you so much for sharing with us this ritual. And tonight, one of our topics is spirituality. Alex, I wonder if you pop back on and just, I wonder if in your patients, your conversations with your patients, does spirituality ever come up? Do people talk to their doctors about faith? Well, I, I, I can tell you that it does come up um, a certain moment. And there are two moments when um, in the discussion, in the clinic, this, this appears. And I can tell you, uh, this is uh, certainly not anything uh, is, is taught in medical school. Uh, but um, the two moments are the moments of the diagnosis, the why me moment. Mm -hmm. And for those um, who have a, a certain progression, um, you know, the, the moment of end of life. Um, and those are moments in which the medicine intercepts a, a whole existential and spiritual dimension of life. And, uh, and you know, as it, it does come out and, and certainly, um, in different ways, and, and, and of course, um, different uh, different sensibilities and different religious background express it in a different way. Um, but yes. And I know that that's something that we want to explore further. In fact, our program on December 16th, we're actually going to go deeper into this conversation. Simka, what advice would you give those living with Parkinson's or their families in terms of spiritual support and counseling? So I, I first want to ask a question. Sure. How, how are your spirits? That question is meant for everybody and nobody. How are your spirits? And the reason I ask that question is because people wonder what we mean by spiritual often. And I always use that question to, to answer it. How are your spirits? Many, if not all of us, have experienced how Parkinson's impacts not only the body, but the mind, the heart, the soul, the spirit. And since all the dimensions of a person are interrelated and interactive, the hip bone being connected to the thigh bone, uh, the spirit, as I understand it, requires attention. Um, and the good news is that everyone has access 
to spiritual resources, which includes everything from music to dance to song, poetry, prayer, rituals, nature, spiritual teachings, and visual arts. It's all on and on. Um, these are activities that buoy and strengthen the spirit to explore and express, to feel alive, growing, and purposeful. So many, as the doctor, as Alex said, many of these resources may derive from religious or spiritual traditions, and many others are uncovered uh, or developed independently. However they are found and developed, there's one resource that in my opinion has no substitute, and that is spiritual community. A group of people who can understand and trust one another, who are there to share and support one another, and to learn and affirm each other's experience. And I believe that's the core of the JCC's uh, PD program. So my advice is to attend to these kinds of spiritual supports in whatever ways you can and would like, but to definitely to connect with a PD community through the programs like those of the JCC. Beautiful. Thank you. And, you know, uh, I'm so glad, Alex, you're getting to meet Simka. He comes to my classes and inspires me all of the time. And uh, one of the things that uh, has really been quite inspiring is that there's a prayer that you wrote. Can you, Alex and I will pop off so that you can share it with our audience again. But um, can you tell us about it and why you wrote it and how it has, this aspect of your spirituality has really helped you in times, as Alex was saying, either when you were first diagnosed or as you're living with Parkinson's. So thank you. Uh, the, the, uh, I have to introduce it by saying that the Hebrew word for prayer, praying to pray, lehit palel, is a reflexive word, meaning the Jewish tradition understands that a prayer is a form of examining, of assessing ourselves uh, in God's presence. Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote the following, which will say it all. Prayer serves many aims. It serves to save the inward life from oblivion. It serves to alleviate anguish. It serves to partake of God's mysterious grace and guidance. Yet ultimately, prayer must not be experienced as an act for the sake of something else. We pray in order to pray. Prayer is a perspective which, from which to behold, from which to respond to the challenges we face. Man in prayer does not seek to impose his will upon God. He seeks to impose God's will and mercy upon himself. The primary purpose of prayer is not to make requests. The primary purpose is to praise, to sing, to chant, because the essence of prayer is a song, and man cannot live without a song. Prayer may not save us, but prayer may make us worthy of being saved. So I wrote my prayer a year, about a year after I was diagnosed with Parkinson's uh, because I needed it. Um, uh, I, had, I already was showing symptoms while my father was dying at the year before the age 94. Uh, and I needed to be able to speak my experience and express my hopes, fears, gratitude, yearnings, and more. And be so before I, I share the prayer, I wanna point out that the beginning, at the beginning and at the end, there are two phrases that I took from the Hebrew prayer book from the 15 blessings that are said towards the beginning of the Jewish morning prayer service. Um, the first of those blessings, thanks God for the crowing of the rooster, meaning the, the alarm clock. The second for making one a Jew, the third for making one a free person and on and on for one's gender, for one's sight, for clothing, etc. And the two phrases I, I chose were from uh, blessings 12 and nine out of order. So I'll share it with you now. Hamechim mitzadei gaver, the one who prepares the steps of mortals. I am a Jew with Parkinson's disease. That says a little about me, maybe even a lot, but not everything. It means that my brain is somewhat disconnected from muscles and limbs, that my balance may be off, my movements altered, limbs rigid and seemingly with their own mind at times. But it also means that I am linked to others, Jews and non-Jews, who must learn to adjust their lives. At times, perhaps often, I need special arrangements and assistance in a world seemingly not constructed or even friendly to those with differing physical abilities. I think of your wanting us to walk with you, dear God, of Father Abraham and Noah and others who walked with you. And even though this is surely metaphorical and not literal, 
I worry about my ability to move properly and adequately. And then my hearts, my thoughts and heart turn to my loved ones who may well be burdened by my needs and limitations, wanting them to take care of themselves and enjoy life and find support and guidance as needed. Choreographer of the universe, help me to exercise and to challenge the inevitable decline of PD. Bless me with renewed or rewired neurological connections with the fortitude and flexibility I need. Help neurologists and physical therapists and all the other healthcare professionals to listen, to instruct, to inquire, and to inspire, to care, to be with me fully, to guide and to learn from me, to further your work of both growing and adjusting, adapting and challenging. Zokev Kifufim, the one who makes straight those who are bent over, thank you for that which goes right, for my spirit which can soar, for all the small and large examples of help and support, for possibilities uncovered, and for so many hopes still alive. Amen. Amen. Wow. Isn't that a beautiful prayer, Alex? Well, it is a beautiful, moving, and um, and challenging in in some ways. Um, I, I I really um, would love this to be shared, um, if we can, with uh, with um, um, you know the the group at large, with the audience, because. Um, I read it before um, for our meeting, and I heard it, um, and I heard the voice um, behind the, the words, and this this um, richness of of, um, of tones, from an acknowledgement to the 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 call to the choreographer of the universe to help neurologists and and therapists and those who care for and the loved ones. And finally, this thank you um, as you as you um, prepared us to 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 listen to. So thank I, I do thank you for sharing this with us. Yeah. Simka, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, remember everyone, we'll put not only the prayer in the comment section and in the chat, and we'll include it in the recording, but we will also be going more deeply into this on Thursday, December 16th with Alex, and we're gonna be working and talking to religious leaders and um, lay people about spirituality and, and what it means when you have a diagnosis or when you're living with challenges in life. So please join us for that as well. Yeah. Alex, our next topic is sexuality. And sex is a natural part of the human experience, as is spirituality and wonder and nature, right? But people living with Parkinson's disease may face concerns about um, the impact of Parkinson's on their ability to have and enjoy sex. And I'm just wondering if we could shift and if you could address from a medical perspective how PD affects our sexual health. Um, yes, it is an important part of, uh, of human experience. And um, as we, we all know, it's, um, it continues to transform itself with, uh, with age. And then there is a, a further transformation for um, the person and the couple um, that um, experience uh, Parkinson. So there are some very specific sort of medical elements uh, to this um, related to the, the, the biology of the disease and related to this, um, the dopamine, you know, is the culprit of, uh, of everything uh, within the brain. So as we know, there is diminished level of dopamine in the brain and dopamine is uh, the, the, the sort of the, the neurotransmitter related not just to movement, but also to reward and enjoyment and engagement and pleasure. Um, and um, one of the elements of, of, of Parkinson is withdrawal. Um, and um, before starting medication, uh, that extends to sexuality many times. There is a, a withdrawal in general from, from activity, from pleasures, and also from, from intimacy. 
There is, however, um, a common transformation that occurs when medications are started, that there is a reactivation of this um, sexual desire. And sometimes, actually, oftentimes, an overactivation. So hypersexuality in people who are taking drugs for Parkinson is a very common phenomenon, so much so that the drugs used for Parkinson are being studied or have been studied independently for people who do not have Parkinson as a sexual stimulants. Um, and this can really reach um, a, really a, a, a level of intensity um, that can create uh, problems for the person who experienced that or for the, the, the partner, um, of the, the sexual partner of the person. Another um, element of sexuality related to, uh, to Parkinson is that the same medication and perhaps an underlying uh, sort of changes in, uh, in the, 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 the sort of the connectivity of the brain in Parkinson predispose people to a more compulsive behavior. So um, you couple the um, hypersexuality and in, in, in enhanced sexual desire, and you uh, sort of add on an element of compulsion, and you add on in the mix uh, a computer. Um, so um, pornography and an addiction to pornography is um, almost common, I would say, um, among people uh, who are partnered. Common maybe is an exaggeration, but it certainly happens uh, frequently. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is the other part of it. So um, there is uh, sexual dysfunction um, that um, is part of the um, what we call the no motor symptoms of, of, uh, of Parkinson's disease. And again, this creates the tensions between uh, an enhanced sexuality and diminished um, functionality uh, in, the, in the sexual domain. Um, and those are just some, some of the, um, the physical elements um, of it. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is a whole other aspects which has to do with intimacy and, and the connection. Uh, with the partner, which I know we will be discussing. Uh, later yeah, on. it's a perfect segue because our next guest is cognitive hypnotherapist Suzette Shamoon, and she's calling in from uh, what is it over the pond, beyond the pond, you know, in London. Suzette is a pas passionate about having frank conversations with people living with PD as well as with spouses, caregivers, healthcare providers, um, doctors. You know, just so that we, she can bring out and, and we can bring out this issue about sexuality and intimacy. She's zooming in from London, as I said. You have to tell us what time it is over there. And I know you have your coffee uh, <laughs> and we so appreciate you're here. Her husband was diagnosed with early onset PD early on in their marriage 23 years ago. They now have four grown daughters and Suzette is pursuing a PhD at the Institute of Neurology in London. She's currently researching well-being in people with Parkinson's and their caregivers. And um, it's just so nice to see you again. Thank you for staying up late and for joining us tonight, Suzette. Thank you for having me. It's 11.30 here, um, oh gosh. which is a perfect okay. time to see you. <laughs> <laughs> and a great time to be talking about sex. It's late at night, right, for you. Um, uh, I will, I'm going to actually let the two of you have a conversation, and then I'll pop back in. And Su Suzette, if you could, there's kind of there's sort of four or five basic areas that you want to cover tonight with Alex. If you could uh, talk about those a little bit, and then um, uh, have a discussion with Alex. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, yes, as you said, I, I don't know about for you, Alex, but for me, when I'm working with clients. Uh, who come to me with their sexual issues and issues pertaining to um, intimacy, I find that there tend to be five different areas which we cover. The first being attraction, the next being frequency, which you've already covered when you talk about, you know, the, those ICDs, those impulse controls issues, um, function being another one. Um, the effect on the relationship, on, on the relationships, how people connect to each other is another one. And then they always ask me about coping skills. Do you find you've got the same thing in your, in your practice? Well, I, I certainly think you, 
you articulate or you you dissect uh, the issues about sexuality in a um, in in a very um, uh, structured way. Um, and certainly, uh, I think you cover all the the key points that emerge um, in uh, in the issue of sexuality in Parkinson. Yeah, so if you were to look at each one of those briefly in the time that we've got, I think the first one that that people tend to come to me with, because I, I don't know about you, but with me as a therapist, it tends to start with attraction um, because they want to ease into the conversation. I don't know, maybe it's a British thing, no sex were British. Um, and I find very often... Uh, it will start either the person with PD or the care partner. Sometimes I'll see them together. Sometimes I'll see them apart. But it will always start with uh, uh, either they're not attracted to each other anymore or they struggle with attraction, feeling attractive, and that affects their relationship. And I know that um, I see it a lot with people with PD when they've got a lot of dyskinesia or they're off, that they don't feel attractive. Or as they're aging, there's also that aging process which can affect attraction. And again, you throw PD into the mix, it's hard. But care partners as well, and I, and I count myself in this as well, having experienced this, um, do you ever find that that comes up in, your, in the room with you? Yes, it does come up and it does come up in in an unusual way I, I'll, I'll i always like to to relate narratives and any any examples and uh, a close examples is um is a is a patient who asked for treatment for the excess saliva uh, which is a common problem uh, in parkinson um and the main motivation was that he felt that um, um his, his his sexual partner was um was um, repulsed by the excess saliva and had manifested that and had pulled away and had, had moved away. Um, this talks to some of, some of the, the issues that, that you mentioned. So um, on one hand, the person with Parkinson may feel um, less attractive, uh, may feel that is uh, sort of um, you know the, the the transformation of the body or or or, or such that um, denies the, the 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 you know the the, the appeal or remove whatever uh, created in terms of sexual appeal is also true and this sometimes is true um, sometimes there are um, partners um, uh, who have told me uh, especially in the situation of hypersexuality. They, they just don't want to have sex anymore uh, with their partner. And sometimes it's because they are um, not attracted um, to the partner anymore. Many times it's because also there is, especially in more advanced cases of Parkinson, there is this kind of overlapping role of uh, um, caregiver and, and spouses or partner uh, and sexual partner and, and at the end of a day in which uh, a person may have been helping showering or bathing and so on, um, the, the, the reacquisition of a, the identity of a, of a partner and a sexual partner is, is just lagging. Um, but this is, is, is a real issue. Um, and sometimes, and many times, it's an unspoken issue and, and I think creates... Um, sort of a growing um, tension. I'll, I'll also give another example of um, um, a person, uh, uh, a care partner, a spouse, um, who um, felt that um, the, the the sort of the um, the lack of attraction uh, was was due to. Um, what with what I discussed briefly, you know, it's sort of not necessarily the physical transformation, but the psychological transformation and the 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 transformation of a person um, who is no longer recognized as a, as a partner in psychological terms more than physical terms. Absolutely. There is that shift in almost like the balance of power within the relationship. And it's trying to bring that back into the relationship as much as possible. And I find that very often there is, a, particularly when you relate it to attraction, even if, if you're not 
discussing what's going on for you, that, again, that creates that divide. And, and intimacy is not just about physical intimacy, isn't it? it's about emotional intimacy. And the more we encourage people to, to discuss these issues. I mean, I had, um, I had a gentleman who came to me once and he said he was struggling because he, his wife had Parkinson's and he couldn't, he couldn't bring her to orgasm anymore. She was struggling to orgasm. And he said he just, he didn't feel attracted to her anymore because he felt like he was using his wife and he just didn't want to be that kind of husband. It was never, sex for him was always about this mutual experience and the fact that it was no longer mutual. It, it created a divide and that divide started playing out in their marriage as him being her care partner her caregiver and it once they started discussing this she you know she turned around she's like you know honey I am I I don't care about the orgasm I want to be touched I miss physical touch and if you don't give me that then you're you're solidifying the fact that I'm your patient now and I'm no longer your wife and there was this beautiful moment in the room where the two of them were able to actually see each other once again as partners and it's it's about bringing those conversations back between partners I find yes I completely agree I think that that's that's the essence and I think that um, the other the other points that you highlight is the fact that um, sexuality still remains kind of an unspoken element um, in uh, in both in the dialogue with uh, with the, the you know the physicians but especially within the couple and so resentment grows and, and is unspoken and is developed and elaborated uh, in its own way. And breaking that cycle is, is very important. The only way to break that cycle is to start talking about it. Absolutely. And it, and it is that thing about speaking about things like frequency, um, whether there is too much at which point ask your physician, is there something going on with your medication or is there not enough? And actually, again, I had um, an interesting situation whereby I, I don't just work with people with Parkinson's. I work with couples who, who are healthy as well, um, who don't have any other issue, underlying issues. And very often when there is sex as an issue, there's always one partner who wants more than the other. I think that's just generally across the board in most relationships. And in this case, the gentleman had a much higher drive than his wife. And all of a sudden he could no longer function as much. And for him, it really affected his masculinity. He started to feel less attractive. He didn't want his wife as much. It was starting to cause an issue within their marriage. And then again, bring them into the room. And she sat down and she was like, do you know, it's a relief for me. I'm quite happy that you can't function as much as you used to be able to. It really isn't a problem for me. And again, just being able to bring these conversations into the room about frequency, for example, was something which was incredibly useful for him because then it was just a matter of, okay, so this is no longer an issue that we need to work on with you as a couple. This is something which we need to work on with you just as an individual because this is you now no longer it's affecting how your sense of self um and therefore it then we started discussing function and and looked at it rather than a frequency level we're looking at function okay and how is that impacting on you um when when we talk about coping skills do you find there are any things in particular what are the main things that that you tend to help people with uh, you know i don't know if i really um, can I set what what um, what I can bring but before sort of discussing that there's another sort of um, hidden ghost in the conversation about uh, sexuality and his uh, infidelity um, this is something that comes up again frequently enough um, that becomes an issue and he's as an infidelity experience on both sides. Um, a person with Parkinson may find outlet to the um, increased sexual desires, the hypersexuality, um, not just through pornography, but through actually acting out with, uh, with a sex partner um, outside the relationship um, or through paid sex. 
Um, and suddenly I have seen, encountered, heard, dealt with the consequences of that. On the other hand, a caregiver or a care partner, um, especially in, as the disease progresses, um, may feel that he or she needs an outlet, um, needs um, not sometimes not just a sexual outlet, but um, a substitute uh, for the partner. Um, and then again, I, I witnessed that. Um, I don't pass judgments, and certainly it's not it's not our role that how to to deal with that. But um, those may or may not be coping uh, elements uh, or functional coping elements. So sometimes they may be functional. Um, but um, certainly I'm interested in your insight about the coping um, and the, the dealing with uh, this, this, this challenges. And we also had a question on the chat. I just want to pop in here. And I know we could talk forever, but we'll, I want to ask this question. And then Suzette, have you comment? And then we'll, we'll uh, get to the other parts of our show. Um, there's a question from Carla who says, are women on PD meds as affected in terms of hypersexuality as men? Uh, the answer is yes, um, except that sexuality is manifests differently in men and women. As I think as we age, also there is a, there is different expression. But yes, uh, um, uh, I've seen and witnessed uh, the, the the effect of uh, the this this the medication. So the combination of medication and Parkinson in women's sexuality or in men's sexuality. I must say, I was I was mentioning that in our preliminary meeting before this, um, that um, I probably am biased in my observation because um, most of your men who discuss sexuality with me, and I think there is a gender issue. Um, I imagine that um, um, female colleagues, women, um, will feel more comfortable talking about um, sexuality with uh, with another woman. Um, so I, I, I may experience, I may be biased. I certainly witness much more frequently men, but that may just be because it's more likely that a man confides to me about sexuality than a woman would. Mm -hmm. And Suzette, can you just finish our conversation on sexuality with your thoughts on, on what Dr. DeRocco was talking about, what Alex was talking about in relationship to coping, and if you have some insights for that? I think with coping, everything is going to be so unique to the couple. There are going to be some couples where absolute honesty is going to bring you closer. It's going to help you to, rather than isolating yourself away from each other and dealing with the issues that you've got on your own, sometimes it's easier to face the challenges together because at the end of the day, this isn't you, it's not your partner, mm -hmm. it's Parkinson's and it's happening to both of you. But interestingly, um, I spoke to a woman recently who had suffered with hypersexuality due to her medication. And for her, the one thing she said that saved her relationship was not being honest. And she said her partner knew that she had, she, she left her partner for a year with the children and she went off and explored. And she said the one thing she doesn't, he doesn't want to know is what she did in that year. And the one thing she doesn't feel she needs to share is what she did in that year. And so it's always going to be about recognizing when it's appropriate to be honest and when it's not. But just bearing in mind that intimacy, emotional intimacy underpins physical intimacy. And so when it comes to coping skills, it's about having those conversations with each other. First of all, exploring it for yourself, then with each other, and then speak to your physician. Yeah, I remember uh, Kathy Washburn, who I interviewed, she said intimacy is into me, yeah. I see. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing and talking openly with us about sex and intimacy. Um, thank you, both of you, for sharing your um, this discussion and uh, Suzette for sharing your journey as well as your work. Um, I'm going to have you both take a little break right now and we're going to have a little entertainment. Well, Stephanie Lynn Maison is going to be our next guest and she is a New York based actress, singer, and her career has spanned national tours and million dollar quartet and numerous regional theater productions across the country. She made her Broadway debut in the 2000. 
15 Tony nominated revival of Fiddler on the Roof, directed by Bartlett Shear in the ensemble, and also covering the principal daughters, then Fruma, Sarah, and Grandma Seitzel. She was most recently seen as Huddle in the critically acclaimed production of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, and this was directed by Joel Gray off Broadway at Stage 42. This role has got to be her favorite to date because it was here that she met her now fiance. Welcome, Stephanie Mazeltov. Congratulations on your engagement. What an exciting time for both of you. Now, I understand that not only are you going to sing for us, but your life has been impacted by Parkinson's like mine. I have a, an uncle, my uncle, John, who I love dearly, who has living with Parkinson's. And you had uh, an uncle in your life that uh, has since passed that was affected by Parkinson's. Can you tell us about him a little bit and what you loved most about him and what Parkinson's taught you? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I just want to say how grateful I am to be here and, and, so, and to be part of such a vulnerable, open, beautiful program. And mm -hmm. I wish something like this would have been around when he was alive. Um, mm -hmm. My uncle was very full of life. He loved music. He loved theater. He loved all of these things. And he was diagnosed and lived with Parkinson's for nine years. And the thing that I remember most is that he really tried to live life with Parkinson's. It wasn't that he gave up. It wasn't that, you know, and it, it, there were up, up days and down days, of course, but he really tried to live life to its fullest as best as he could. And I mean, I think seeing a loved one progress like that is always difficult. Um, my Aunt Sue, his wife his, who survived him, she was such an incredible caretaker for him. And mm -hmm. I know that the impact that it had on her, at the very end, you know, for the last year he was requiring 24 hour care. And I think the hardest mm -hmm. thing for her was that it went into more of a dementia state. Mm -hmm. um, okay. But he, even to the end, he still, he loved music. He loved theater. He would always come to travel and see me in all my shows. And, you know, um, we were very close and he has a very near, dear place in my heart. And, um, but there's so much about him that I feel is still with me. So. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they say, you know, when we go on stage, everyone that has been on the stage before us is there. And I really believe that you're, when you sing, I'm sure your uncle is listening. Will you sing for us now? Can you tell us a little bit about the song that you've selected tonight and what it was like to originate this role as, as Huddle in the Yiddish version of Fiddler on the Roof? And then um, we'll have you uh, perform for us tonight. Absolutely. So this song is Weit von mein Lieber Heim, or also known as Far From the Home I Love. And Hoddle sings this song when she is leaving her family to go to Siberia to follow the love of her life um, and going to a completely new place. She's leaving everything she knows, everything that she loves. And the song and the way that it relates to this is that I know, for example, when my aunt had to put my uncle in an assisted living facility, both people are making that sacrifice and taking that risk and there's an, there's an, there's a sense of loss. Um, so this song I think can relate to so many people and um, it has a very near dear in place in my heart. So here we go. <laughs> Oh, what a melancholy choice this is. 
Thank you. Thank you. Tell us your uncle's name. Tom Cregan. Mm -hmm. And he was a lovely, mm -hmm. lovely, wonderful, wonderful man. And mm -hmm. again, what this group is doing is so incredibly beautiful. And I just, my thoughts every day are with the scientists and caregivers and everyone out there trying to help people living with this disease cope with it and their loved ones because it's not easy. And my heart just goes out to everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. We'll have to have you back. I would love to come back. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. And if, speaking of having people back, our next guests, Chris and Mary Beth, are returning to the show to talk about their recent decision to choose assisted living for Chris. Please welcome John Christopher Jones, or Chris as he likes to be called, and his wife, Mary Beth Crudell. Chris has been a part of our JCC program since its inception. He's an accomplished actor whose credits include stage and screen and Broadway. And his most recent appearance was this past September on a TV episode of New Amsterdam. Mary Beth, his wife of 26 years, is a kindergarten teacher here in New York City. They are the proud parents of three kids, Hayden, Catherine, and Charlotte. Welcome back to the show, you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> it's nice to see you tonight. You, too. you know, you guys recently made a tough decision um, to move Chris into an assisted living facility not too far from where you live in New York City. What factors may led you to making that decision? You want to start? Okay. Um, it's great. We started with spirituality because it was really our pastor who told us we should start looking. And this was a year or two ago. And well, before COVID. So uh, we started looking. She took us to some places. She knew about um, elder care places. But basically, she said, look, we don't know what's going to work for Chris, but we know what's not working now, which is staying at home. Chris had had several falls. Uh, we'd been to the emergency rooms a few times before um, he was last. Uh, uh, he moved in to um, the assisted living place in end of May. End of May. Mm -hmm. he, we had looked at another place that was really closer to home, but he was denied acceptance. It was like going to college, mm -hmm. but they said he had like too much need. And mm -hmm. um, he had been to an independent living place for two weeks. Right, well, when, uh, that was a smart move, I think. We decided that we try one out for a couple of weeks. And they had a system where they could take you for a couple of weeks. You just paid half the month's rent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, two years before we started looking, we, we did this trial, mm -hmm. which when Mary Beth left in the car, mm -hmm. I was on the hill and she was driving away. Made me feel like the loneliest man in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. And Chris, was that when? But then he yeah, was winding right. up doing Shakespeare workshops for people and playing bridge, and it wasn't that it, bad. It was, it, was, it, was, it was a nice, it was a nice facility, and I like the people there. Wow. Now, so, what what are there? Um, what things are easier with this new arrangement, and are there things that are more difficult? Well, mm -hmm. it's. Well, this is this is an interesting arrangement because I have an apartment. We have an apartment on 75th and Riverside, and the facility that I'm staying at is in Riverdale, which is about five or five miles away. So it, it's a it's a 20 minute ride to, to my apartment to my life as it used to be. And uh, so that's very important for me to have my family around. And I come to this, the, the city often and go to my apartment and have dinner and mm -hmm. and keep keep the tendrils connected. I think it also does keep us. Uh, it's interesting the discussion about sexuality. We're more partners again than me having to get up. I have to get up early for work. And previously, my first task was, you know, helping with some bathroom things for Chris. And it's nice 
not to have to do that quite honestly and just get myself up and ready. Um, so that's been easier the mornings for me because I already have to get up early to get to school as a teacher. And um, I don't know if you find the mornings easier too. Well, you don't have to get up so early. Uh, my life now, I get three three meals a day, a day and I don't have to do the dishes. Yeah, that no dishes nice. is better. <laughs> So, now, if you were talking to other families who might be making this decision, what things should they consider? I would, I would consider doing a trial run at a place. We uh, also did um, talk to elder care lawyer, um, like the first time maybe eight or ten years ago, and then three, four years ago, and then we worked with the lawyer about setting up this pooled income trust and Medicaid. And it's not, to, I mean, it cost us some thousands of dollars to work with the elder care lawyer, but it was definitely worth it because we got our ducks in a row and it, and it wasn't easy. Well, there was still a lot of work. If you qualify for Medicaid, your bills can be maybe a thousand to 1500 a month. But so, if, if you don't qualify for Medicaid, you have to pay the full. The Medicaid isn't paying part of it. You have to pay the full price, and that can be seven to twelve thousand dollars a month. So we were, you know, we still have like three college-age children, two in college. So we wanted to be sure to be able to pay for our kids' college, you know, and Chris's care, and it is expensive to higher private care and so we you know we did talk to a lawyer and work with them so i would advise people to do that so just to recap the process was you guys um what about how many years ago eight years ago did you talk with the to the elder, elder care? care lawyer yeah okay and so you really sort of were thinking about this quite ahead of time. I'm going to bring, um, thank you so much, you guys, for sharing with us and being so open and very personal about private decisions. We appreciate how much you're sharing and with us, because this is a decision that sometimes people put off. And it sounds to me like you were advised, you know, as you said, from your religious leader, from your minister, put, to just put, take a look at this. Yeah. Put your toe in the water, put wiggle it around. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I wonder, Alex, if you might come back and just I answer a question which I have, which is that, you know, what advice or resources do you share with clients and patients when concern arises about safety, care, quality of life decisions? And when do families need to start having these conversations? Just unmute, Alex. Sorry. <clears throat> I was saying that I think Chris and Mary Beth articulated and illustrating in a, in a very precise way how um, the process, when to start the process and when and how to, to go on with the process. It's not an easy decision in many ways, um, but certainly there is a time when life at home becomes unmanageable or so difficult to manage that the consequences of the, 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 the complexity on sort of you know, at a practical level, on the psychological level, on the, the relation level are so, so many that, that um, this is something that should be considered. It's not an easy step, um, not just for the financial reason and the planning reason, uh, but also because, um, unfortunately, there are very, very few assisted living place who have any knowledge or any competence about Parkinson's disease. This is a question I often get. Um, so can you recommend, you know, uh, um, sort of a couple of um, um, assisted living uh, that have, um, you know, some knowledge and expertise in Parkinson? And the answer is that there isn't really uh, anyone, even those facilities that advertise expertise um, usually have really just uh, just sort of a superficial uh, knowledge. 
And so issues about, you know, taking the medication on time, doing some type of, of, of physical therapy, recognizing an off uh, from a non period, um, um, sort of dealing with, um, I don't know, some, um, again, fluctuation and uh, on speech and uh, all that we know is, is part of Parkinson, which is in kind of the, the basic alphabet for, for dealing with Parkinson is completely lacking. Even in the most expensive, even the most um, sort of, uh, um, even the richer um, of this assisted living facilities. So this is something that creates one of the many voids uh, in the care for Parkinson, um, and this is um, it's again requires in many ways the kind of partnership that I believe uh, Chris and Mary Beth established with the assisted living. So you. You kind of go and teach um, the people how to carry it. Um, you kind of tell people, well, look, it's not, it's not that I'm acting out this. I'm having an off period. It's not that an hour ago I could talk and now I'm, I'm moving. Now I can't. It's just that's the nature of the disease. Um, and sort of that kind of uh, engagement um, that in the right place it can be done. But it's not an easy process. Wow. That's really important information. Have you guys found that you're in essence leading the pack, teaching those at the facility a little bit about Parkinson's? Well, they they don't they don't learn that easily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying oh, to explain to them. We can we can spend I can spend a half an hour trying to put my clothes on, or you can do it with me in, in a minute. A minute. Uh, and, they don't, they don't always get it. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for bringing up a really important part of living with Parkinson's and also going into an assisted living facility or choosing that option. And, and even when we uh, are working and, and, and going into new um, new relationships, right? It's really letting people know, this is what I need. As Suzette was talking about, this is the communication. This is, I imagine the same thing happens, Chris, when you're on the set a new set and doing a show that you have to also explain a little bit about what you need too. Is that also true? Well, it's, it doesn't happen that often. So it doesn't come, it doesn't come up. <laughs> you doesn't act come up. more. I'm going to challenge you on that because you act more than m most people I know. I mean, I was, you've been on a lot of things. Don't you think Mary Beth, he's been on yeah. quite was, a few things. I was thinking yeah. of, of the, the, the intimacy section. And there's a sonnet that it goes, when my love swears that she is made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies, that she might think me some untutored youth, unlearned in the world's false subtleties, thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young, although she knows my years are past the best. Simply I credit her false speaking tongue. On both sides, then, is simple truth suppressed. That's the, the idea of it. <laughs> We've got a performance, too. Thank you guys so much for joining the show again. You know I adore you both, and I just thank you so much for your honesty. To What you can uh, stay on, we're going to uh, dance with Pamela Quinn. And Dr. DeRocco, I know you and Pam are fast friends. Um, Pamela is going to get us moving because we know that moving is medicine for people living with PD. No one knows this better than Pamela Quinn. Pam has been living with PD for 27 years. How was that even possible, Pam? I don't know. You're remarkable. <laughs> you inspire me and uh, delight me. And we have had a, a wonderful time dancing and together, moving together, teaching together. And you are a dancer, choreographer, and creator of the PD Movement Lab program here at the JCC. You're here to bring us home, to take us out uh, the show of the show tonight. Um, you're here to close our show and inspire us to stay and get moving. Thank you, Caroline, for having me. You're welcome. I want to tell you how's your... Yeah, 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 go ahead. I was going to say, it's a hard act to follow up that sonnet, <laughs> you know. 
That was wonderful. Uh, I know, right? And also Stephanie's singing. And it's just, there's so much talent out there. And, and it makes me, as Sitka was telling earlier, like when I connect to nature and art and singing and music and dance, I feel more alive. How has your curiosity in developing new ways to move with PD helped you navigate progression and helped you feel more alive? Oh, um, I think that there's a direct connection between my uh, searching for and discovery of ways to help me move and the progression of my PD. Um, I think that underlying all of that is the basic belief that the more I can reinforce a normal movement pattern, the better off I will be. And so in that regard, uh, I've searched for things that help me uh, counteract my Parkinson's symptoms, um, things that I can use in my life at home, in my life outside, uh, things that are portable, um, that don't cost much, and that are easy to use. And these are um, mainly cues, which are... Um, external prompts that facilitate movement. And um, I think it's the fact that I've used these on a regular basis, not only when I'm moving in a dance class, but when I'm leaving my house and going to the class and leaving the class and coming back home, that my life has been a walking heavy life. And I've benefited from that and using um, things that I find in my environment to help me. When you say a walking heavy life, what do you mean? Because you, you walk around a lot? Yes. You actually mean you physically walk around. I remember yes. one of the things that you said to do was that you would watch yourself in one of the shop mirrors as you would pass, and you'd be like, oh, am I standing straight? Is that what you mean by these kind of cues? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That's a postural cue I use all the time. Um, particularly because with PD, we often have trouble with proprioception, which is the ability to know where you are in space. And if I can't feel that, but I can see it, then that gives me information about, oh, I've got to stand up. I'm, I'm way forward, you know. So, um, so that things like that help me reinforce good patterns. You know what I love about your classes and about your work is that it's uh, it's like you're an inventor. <laughs> I feel like you're an inventing movement sequences all the time. And you've uh, recorded something that you're going to share with us. Very simple, everybody. But if you did this every day, you would improve your rotation. You would improve your core rigidity. You'd improve your uh, amplitude, the size of your movements. And it's it's only a few minutes. Well, do you agree? And would you share it with us? Absolutely. And just to let you know, it's for everyone. No, no previous experience required. Awesome. All right, Matt, let's take it away. Hi, I'm Pamela Quinn, and thanks for coming today. I'm going to take you through some exercises that are designed specifically to offset Parkinson's symptoms. To give you an example, People with Parkinson's often move in a collapsed and small way, and we're going to move in a big extended way. Or to counteract rigidity in the spine and the neck, we're going to use images that help loosen our bodies up. So you should be sit seated in a firm chair with space to the side for your arms to move. And if I do anything that hurts you, back off. Otherwise, enjoy. I'm going to change my glasses, there we go, and I'm going to change my orientation, all right. Follow along, I'll do each movement about four times. Bend your elbows, extend down, and up like a big sun, the sun is setting, now the sun is rising. Again, extend out, and the sun comes up, spreading light all over the earth. And stretch out, in, extend through the spine as well as through the arms. Way 
stay up and twist to the back and reach twist and reach twist and reach twist and reach extend through the leg other leg pressing through the heel toes are up reaching through the back of the leg reach now with an arm and nice graceful bow lifting up reaching out lifting up to the spine stretch forward and up one more time reaching and wrap the back press through the chest and wrap Press through the whole spine and round. Press through and round. Press through. Now you're going to wag your tail like you're a little dog, a happy dog. Now let that reverberate in the spine, in the shoulders, and the head, and the neck. Become a very happy dog. Let it go. Now we're going to pretend we're in a carriage ride, a bumpy one, because James Parkinson said his patients always did better after they rode in a bumpy carriage ride. Uh, you can use your voice to check it if it's bumpy. And let that die down. Stretch one leg out, one arm out, other leg, other arm, and reach all the way up to bottom. Come up. And down. And reach out. All the way. And up through the spine as the arms come down. Thank you. Wow. That was wonderful. <laughs> I hope... Everyone out there was stretching and dancing with us. Pam, thank you so much. That was oh, my great. pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Um, Alex, did you want to say hello to Pam? I always find that Pam is both uh, a very a great inspiration and also someone who turns with a great smile the, 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 the awareness that she finds into into lessons that help um, those who have Parkinson and those like me who work with Parkinson. I, I've learned so many insight and I learn how to think differently. Um, thank you to Pam. I so, have one for you, Alex. This is for facial masking. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> this is idea to keep myself from smiling. Otherwise I go frown. <laughs> this is I, knew. <laughs> I love it very much. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Where's mine? Oh, I don't. I'll have to use my finger. <laughs> there you go. All See, right. you're inventive you. too. <laughs> Alex yeah, and I want to thank. That's genius. <laughs> yes, I know. It's really true. Alex and I want to thank every one of our guests. If you're here, come back on the show. Feel free to unmute and say good night. Remember, there's no need to face PD alone. We're here for you. The Edmund J. Safra Parkinson's program, the JCC, is easily accessible at www.mmjccm.org forward slash Parkinson's. Our next Broadway Best will be on Monday, December 20th at 6 p.m. Special thanks to all our guests, Stephanie, Simca, Rab, Rabbi Simca Weintraub, Suzette Shamoon, um, Chris Jones, Pam Quinn, and of course, my co-host, Alex. Rocco. Broadway Bass for PD is supported by a community grant from the Parkinson's Foundation. We are so grateful. And a special thank you to Northwell Health for their support. It's time to say goodbye, everybody. So we look forward to see you, you again. We're going to wave, say stay well, stay safe. Good night, everyone.